When the FL Sun S1 was first announced, I was really excited. If you watched last week's video, you already know I'm a huge sucker for Delta printers, and my previous experience with FL Sun had been largely positive. The S1 seemed like a massive leap forward compared to their previous generation, the V400, and I hadn't seen anything near its price point as far as Deltas go on the market. Unfortunately, the experience I've had has been largely an overpromise and underdeliver as far as claims on the product page versus actual machine capabilities. While they absolutely did some things right, the max flow rate is largely exaggerated, the closed loop steppers leave VFAs on the parts surfaces, and there's just some bizarre design choices like CPAP cooling pulling in air externally instead of from the inside of the machine, leading to warping on just about anything other than PLA or PETG. On top of that, I was told early on that SSH access was coming and that they were working on releasing an open source version of their firmware because this is running Clipper, but eight months later and that just didn't happen. Then about a month ago, I saw a post by my buddy Killa Prince of the S1 with the splash screen reading FL Sun Open Source Edition. This led to me doing some digging and discovering this. A fully open source firmware created by the community member Guilos that provides a host of new features for the S1. This past week, I went through the process of installing it on my S1 and we'll be diving into it in today's video. We'll go over a bit more on what the firmware is, some of the features it offers, and we'll go step by step through the installation process. So with all that being said and without further ado, let's get right into today's video. Thank you to PCBWay for sponsoring today's video. With over a decade of experience, PCBWay provides reliable, high quality PCB prototyping and fabrication with super fast turnaround times. In addition to PCBs, they offer CNC machining, 3D printing, sheet metal fabrication, and injection molding services. I recently used their SLM printing for a 3D printed tool head, and the results were fantastic. Whether your project is big or small, PCBWay has you covered with order quantities from 5 to 10,000 boards. Use the link in the description to get a $5 credit towards your first order today. Let's start by covering a little more on what FL Sun Open Source Edition is. This is a community-based firmware mod that uses the micro SD card port of the core board to boot into a new OS. The way it works doesn't require any permanent modifications to the printer, so if you should want to go back to the stock setup and stock firmware, you can do so in just a few steps. While the stock OS is based on Debian 10 that expired last year, Open Source Edition is based on Debian 12. Debian 12 is supported until 2028, and the creator even provided some benchmarking showing a slight performance gain over the stock OS. Access to Clipper's backend might be enough reason in itself for you to want to install this firmware, but there's also a nice large list of improvements and features that come along with the open source firmware. I'll have a link in the description to the wiki for anyone that wants to take a dive through this full list, but some of the big ones are getting the latest versions of Moonraker, Clipper, Clipper Screen, and Kaya. That's right, this install replaces the stock screen interface with Clipper Screen, so you get the full Clipper Screen experience directly from your S1. This includes a few additional options specific for the S1, but I find this interface more intuitive and it gives you much further control directly from your printer. There's improvements to the printer's configuration files, including M600 for filament swapping, dry box control from directly within the web interface, and improved power loss recovery. You can also choose to swap out mainsail for fluid or decide to run both. You also get advanced delta calibration along with further control over meshing, allowing you to set a full mesh, variable mesh, or no mesh before each print. Now that we know some of the benefits that this firmware provides, let's go through the installation process. Before we begin, you'll need a few things. This includes a set of drivers or Allen keys for opening up the printer and two micro SD cards. The first should be 16 gigabytes or larger and is going to be used for the main OS. The second should be 128 or 256 megabytes and it's only used for flashing the controller. The reason for this size is to hopefully avoid any issues with compatibility. One other thing I strongly recommend ordering is one of these ST-Link V2 programmers. 
Depending on the firmware version you've got installed in your printer, this might be required to flash the board. And it has some additional utility allowing you to flash the firmware on the closed loop steppers, but we'll touch a bit more on that later. We'll start by flashing the controller so that it supports the latest version of Clipper. Start by taking your smaller size micro SD card and inserting it into your computer and flashing it in FAT32 format. On Windows, it's as easy as right clicking on the micro SD card from within File Explorer, selecting Format, and choosing FAT32 from the drop down menu before clicking Flash. On Mac, there's a couple of options like using Disk Utility, or there's a third party app that I've used in the past that'll have linked in the description. Once formatted, click on the Robin Nano 35 bin file in the FLSUN open source wiki to download it and then drag it over to the root of your SD card. With that done, we're ready to flash the controller. Start by turning off the printer and unplugging the power cable. To access the board, you need to remove the six screws holding the panel on the top of the printer. There's two different versions of the controller, with one being V1.2 and one being V1.3, but this process is identical. Locate the micro SD card slot, install your SD card that has that firmware bin file, and switch the printer on. The flashing process should only take a few seconds, so there's no need to let the printer fully boot. If you turn on that switch and just count to 10, that is more than enough. Before doing anything else, power off the printer, remove the micro SD card, and connect it back to your computer. When you open up File Explorer and click on the card, what you want to see is that it's been renamed from a .bin file to a .cur file. This is how you'll know whether your board has been flashed successfully. Mine still had a .bin file, so I tried a couple different things. The first was just putting it back in the printer and trying again. Then I swapped from my Mac to my Windows PC, reformatted the micro SD card, tried the whole process again. And the last thing I did was swap to a completely different micro SD card. None of these worked for me, which leads me to believe I may have updated to an FLSUN firmware that overrides the bootloader. The guide states that this happens if you flash the board with the firmware provided by FL Sun in their silent kit guide, which I didn't do. But regardless, I was unable to flash it via micro SD card, which leads us to the ST-Link V2 programmer. I used the link in the wiki to order this directly off of Amazon. And what this allows you to do is connect it directly to some headers on that controller so that you can flash the firmware without the need of using that micro SD port. For this method, aside from the device itself and some DuPont cables, you'll need a Windows PC to download the motherboard firmware bin file within the ST-Link section of the wiki and the STM32 ST-Link utility software, which is a mouthful. Download this program from the wiki and install it like you would install any other program on your computer. Once the installation completes, there'll be a pop-up telling you to install some drivers. Make sure that you accept and you go through the on-screen instructions to get those drivers installed. Now that we have what we need, we are ready to flash the controller. Start by connecting one end of the DuPont cables to the SWCLK, SWDIO, ground, and 3.3 volt pins of your flasher. The one I purchased had the pinouts on the device itself and it matched with the one in the wiki, but depending on where you sourced yours from, you may need to check the product page for that info. While the board version didn't matter when we were trying to flash the firmware with a micro SD card, it does matter when you're using the flasher because we want to ensure we're connecting to the correct pins and don't accidentally damage our board. You're looking for six pin headers sticking up from the controller. If you look at the silk screen around those pins, you'll see the numbers 1, 2, 5, and 6. 3 and 4 aren't labeled, but the pin between 1 and 5 is 3, and the pin between 2 and 6 is 4. Using the diagram provided in the wiki as a reference, connect SWCLK to pin 3, SWDIO to pin 1, ground to pin 4, and 3.3 volts to pin 2. From what I can tell based off the images in the wiki, it looks like the orientation of the pins is flopped for the 1.2 board versus the 1.3. So when you're doing this, make sure you're checking that diagram and not just mirroring what I'm doing and what you're seeing on screen. Next, plug the USB connection of the ST-Link into your computer. The included DuPont cables, at least with the one I ordered, are incredibly short. So hopefully you have access to a USB extender Otherwise, you'll be like me, standing at the top of your printer with a laptop right next to it. 
On the computer, open the STM32 utility software that you installed just a moment ago and click on the icon at the top of a power cable to connect to your board. If you have an error pop up, it either means that you didn't install the drivers or your cables are not on the correct pins of your controller. What you should see is the device memory showing up in a list of rows and columns. Click on file, open file, and locate the motherboard firmware bin file that we downloaded from the wiki and open it. Then click on the icon three to the right of the connect icon that looks sort of like a book or page representing program verify. In this window, make sure that everything matches with the options from the wiki, then click the start button to flash the controller. This should be a fairly quick process, and in my case, it took roughly 30 to 40 seconds for the flashing to complete. Make sure at the bottom of the link utility, you see memory programmed verification OK. Then click the power icon at the top one more time to disconnect from your board, unplug the DuPont cables from the pin headers, and reinstall the top cover on your printer. With that out of the way, we can now move on to preparing our larger SD card to install the open source OS. Start by downloading the FLSUN image from the wiki, and if you don't already have it, download and install Raspberry Pi Imager. Connect your micro SD card to your computer and open the Raspberry Pi Imager program. Click choose OS, then scroll all the way to the bottom and select use custom. In the window that opens, locate the open source OS file that we just downloaded and click open to select it. Then click the choose storage button and select your micro SD card. Make sure you select the correct device here so you don't accidentally format your computer's hard drive or maybe another flash drive that you didn't intend to erase. Click next and no on the pop-up window asking about OS customization settings. Finally, click yes on the warning about erasing your memory card to begin flashing. Depending on the speed of your micro SD card, it might take a few minutes to complete the flashing and verification process. The key thing you want to see is a right successful pop-up when it's all complete. If you don't, try flashing it again or even trying a different micro SD card. We need to insert this micro SD card into the board located at the backside of the printer's screen. To access it, we have to remove the screen housing that you would have installed when you first received your printer. Inside of the front glass door are two screws that we'll need to start with removing. Once those are out, there's another two screws at the bottom of the screen assembly that also need to be removed. It was a little tricky to get these on camera, but there's two fairly obvious openings that if you just shove a driver inside of, you'll feel the screw that needs to be removed. With those out, we'll pull the screen housing towards us just enough to access the cables plugged into the back. There's three USB-C cables to remove and one power cable. The USB cables are all numbered, which is really helpful when we go to plug things back in. The final screws that need to come out are the eight holding that screen housing together. Make sure you put them somewhere safe, as we'll be putting this back together in just a moment. Now that the screws are out, we can open the two halves of the screen cover to gain access to that board inside. You're more than welcome to completely separate those two halves, but in mine, I saw some ribbon cables and it felt like there was some adhesive, so I really just opened it enough to gain access to the micro SD port. This is located along the underside edge, and while I was able to fit the card in with my fingers, it might be easier to use something like tweezers to at least line it up and avoid accidentally dropping it underneath the board. Once installed, you can close the shell back up, reinstall the screws, plug the four cables into the back of the screen, and secure the screen housing onto the printer again. As a safe measure, it's probably not a bad idea to just loosely close everything up and boot on the printer to make sure that the OS is working as it should be to avoid having to take everything back apart if you run into some issue. Now it's time for the moment we've been waiting for. Connect the power cable to your printer and power it on. You'll know in just a few seconds whether everything is working when you're presented by the beautiful FLSUN open source edition splash screen. Give the printer a minute to boot into clipper screen and then click on the configuration menu and network to connect it to your Wi-Fi network. The final step is to reboot the printer from Clipper screen to complete the OS installation. From here, you'll want to go through the calibration menu to calibrate the motors, Z offset, bed mesh, and input shaping. 
Congratulations, you are now up and running with open source firmware on your S1 and have tons of additional options and control to improve both printing and usability. By default, this process installs firmware that's intended for a stock S1. If you installed a silent kit or are planning on adding the Big Tree Tech MMB for additional hardware control, there's other firmware options available and instructions on how to swap firmware versions over SSH in the wiki. So far, I've been really pleased with this firmware and feel like it's a massive quality of life improvement over the stock setup. One thing that's driven me a bit crazy about the S1 is the VFAs or vertical fine artifacts present on the outer wall of just about every print. I was told by FL Sun that with a firmware update, this was heavily improved, but before I updated to the open source firmware, I updated to the latest stock firmware and I really didn't see any difference. In the open source firmware wiki, there's instructions on using that same ST link tool to flash the closed loop steppers with the same firmware that comes on the S1 Pro. This is supposed to greatly reduce those artifacts and is next on my list. When explaining the process of doing this upgrade, I realized it sounds like it's quite involved, but I promise you it's not that bad. And in this video, we covered two scenarios, one with the micro SD card not working and two with the flasher, but if you follow the instructions outlined in the wiki, there's step-by-step -step and there's nice photos, this entire process really shouldn't take you more than maybe 30 minutes. The 3D printing community never ceases to amaze me, and while this is absolutely something that I wish was done by the manufacturer, it's incredible to see what can be done with the right knowledge and determination. Massive shout out to the creator Guilos for their amazing work, as well as all contributors listed in the documentation. I'm once again looking forward to using my S1 and hopeful that I can get it to a place where I can actually lean on it. And that has been the FL Sun Open Source Edition firmware. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you're either up and running or at least have a much better understanding of what it is and how to get it installed. If you have any additional questions, let me know in the comments. And as mentioned a few times, I will have any links that I think are helpful, but especially the one over to the wiki available in the description. On that note, don't forget to like and subscribe for more great videos. We make a video just about every single week. So there's always fresh content coming your way. And if you do want to support the channel further, I'll have links down below in the description over to our Patreon, where there are some really awesome rewards. Huge thank you to all of our existing Patreon supporters. I appreciate each and every one of you for allowing me to come back every single week and spend more time doing what I love, which is making content for you all to enjoy. On that note, this has been Daniel from ModBot. I look forward to seeing you guys in my next video. Peace, guys.